So I'll start actually with a conflict of interest. Um, I uh, am a co-founder of uh, A1C Foods, which is, uh, was a company that was started uh, by a father of a patient of mine that was looking to create delicious low-carb food. And this is really in its infancy. And I used to do a lot of consulting way back then before I converted to low-carb, but now I have nothing to report. So let's start. So let's talk about the reawakening the pancreas in type 2 diabetes, aka reversing diabetes. And we're going to talk about this more at a cellular level. What does it really mean? And uh, before I dive into the nitty gritty, because there is quite a bit of nitty gritty, I want you to just take home this message, which is the sooner we treat, the more likely we are to reverse disease. So with that said, let's start. So usually when you go to a conference, or wherever you read a, an article about diabetes, it says diabetes is a one-way street, things really just get worse over time, and pretty much no matter what treatment we do, we expect things to worsen. But we're here because we really think that's not true. So let's start with diabetes definition of type 2. Essentially, we need to have insulin resistance as well as beta cell failure in order to have diabetes. And Insulin resistance by itself is just metabolic syndrome. Beta cell failure by itself is actually type 1 diabetes. But when you have it combined, we have type 2 diabetes. Now, beta cells are extremely specialized, beautiful cells. And they start off as stem cells. And they go through this process, this conversion from, to intermediate cells that eventually become this very specialized cell that knows exactly how much glucose comes in and how much insulin needs to be secreted in order to function properly. And this process is called differentiation. Now, you need to have some kind of predisposition in order to get type 2 diabetes. One is, for example, having a small pancreas. As was discussed this morning, if you are malnourished as a mother, you may make an offspring with very, just a small number of beta cells. The more common scenario is having a normal number of beta cells but genetic defect, or a normal number of beta cells with an environmental injury, um, or a slow autoimmune attack, which is really LADA, latent autoimmune disease that gets misclassified as type, one, as type 2 diabetes. So why do these beta cells fail? Well, first of all, it might be that these beta cells die. And we get this information from cadavers. We lo researchers looked at the pancreases of cadavers, and they saw, first of all, in those people without diabetes, when we compare the lean in comp to the obese, we see that obese patients do a really good job at compensating for that increased demand in insulin. So they're able to rev up those beta cells. In contrast, those people who get diabetes no, their beta cell mass is greatly reduced. And this is what we see under light microscopy. So let's take a look here. In the top left, you see um, a slide of an islet of Langerhans. Under the light microscopy, you see the, the brown is actually insulin. We're staining for insulin, and it's staining very nicely. In comparison to the, the slide underneath, the, the, um, this slide is basically missing the brown staining, because there is no insulin. It's, it's not lighting up. But if we look with a much more powerful microscope, the electron microscope, we see that, hey, it looks like there's something there. It may not have been staining for insulin, but it's not actually dead. There are some beta cells there that are hanging out in a dormant state. So this dormant state is called de-differentiation. Remember that we looked at how a stem, a stem cell became a beta cell through a process of differentiation. This is going backwards, de-differentiation. And sometimes, actually, these beta cells get converted to alpha cells, which are glucagon-producing cells. And these alpha cells, this is called trans-differentiation. And we know that alpha cells secrete glucagon, and there is a paradoxical increase in glucagon in diabetes, which we target when we treat diabetes as clinicians with DPP-4 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonists in order to try to reduce this glucagon because glucagon increases sugar in the blood. What do we need that for when we already have high sugars? 
So this might be in part because of this trans differentiation of beta cells to alpha cells. All right, so here's a schematic view of a beta cell. And glucose comes in, and it has to be metabolized in order for it to be coupled to insulin secretion. So it has to go through the mitochondria. A lot of things happen there. And in the end, it, it, calcium has to rush into the cell. Insulin is produced through a process of first being pre-pro-insulin, then pro-insulin, and finally insulin is released under the appropriate stimulus. Now, when a cell gets de-differentiated, all of the special enzymes and transcription factors that make a beta cell special, it go, they go away. They start to be the expression, the gene expression goes down. And these are, you can see in pink on the slide. On the other hand, all those boring cells that are not doing anything special, they have enzymes that are not expressed in beta cells, and those are in green. But when a beta cell gets de-differentiated, what happens is that those special enzymes go away, and the non-special enzymes go up. So a beta cell is kind of like Superman. Superman is Mr. Differentiated. He's super, super powerful and can do things that nobody else can do. But then, when he takes the kryptonite, he becomes weak and powerless. So we want to know what is the kryptonite of beta cells? So there are three causes that are debated that lead to de-differentiation. Glucotoxicity, lipotoxicity, and inflammation. So let's take a look at this. All right, let's start with glucotoxicity. A little bit of sugar or sugar at a physiological level, a good thing. It makes beta cells secrete very nicely, it makes them work the way they should work. But too much glucose is actually damaging. So I was actually involved uh, in a study, in this study that I think actually shows this quite nicely. Um, this was way back, like almost 20 years ago at the Joslin with uh, Gordon Weir and um, Ross Leibut. And this, this study involved put, something called pancreatectomy, a partial pancreatectomy, where they, the rats underwent surgery, a little bit of the, the pancreas was removed, and this made them hyperglycemic. If, how hyperglycemic depended on how much was removed, but in the end, the, mice, the, the rats ended up moving into two groups, a group that became very hyperglycemic and a group that became mildly hyperglycemic. So then, after a while, after 14 weeks, the rats were sacrificed, and we checked all of the expression of uh, their gene expression of all their specialized enzymes. And what we saw, let's take a look here at insulin, for example, is that after 14 weeks of being exposed to really high sugars, those beta cells had lost the expression of insulin. Now, there was another group that wasn't sacrificed immediately and were instead had their glucose corrected completely. They were given a drug that's the predecessor to the SGLT2s that uh, are now in the market today, inhibitors that are in the market today. So it's called fluorazine. And fluorazine makes you pee out the sugar in the urine. And this is what happened to the rats. And they had normal sugars after being exposed to very high sugars. And what's nice is that actually they were able to improve their markers. All their, the insulin, for example, you could see that the expression of insulin goes up again. Now, in the case of these that had 14 weeks of high sugars first, it didn't normalize completely. It still, it came back, but not all the way. We know from a prior experiment that after four weeks of high sugars instead of 14, it normalized completely. So the duration and the severity of hyperglycemia matters on how much you can correct this, uh, this defect. So let's look at lipotoxicity. To my surprise, actually, I didn't know that beta cells had a receptor to, to fat, but they do. And a little fat actually causes insulin secretion. A lot of fat actually causes beta cell damage. If you take fat and you pour it on a Petri dish on top of beta cells, it really damages them and causes them to de-differentiate. Now, 
let's take a look at um, uh, the, f uh, the this is called the, the Zucker diabetic rat. And this rat first accumulates a lot, a lot of fat, and then it becomes diabetic. So you can see that what happens here is that first the fat changes the morphology of the, of the beta cell, and only then, after this rapid accumulation, it becomes diabetic. So this is a very commonly used model of, of animals. In humans, we think that the, it's, it's the fatty acids that are coming from the liver that end up being deposited in the pancreas and causing and wreaking a little bit of havoc. So what about inflammation? Again, a little inflammation might be a good thing. For example, in pregnancy, a little hyperglycemia causes a little bit of inflammation, and this inflammation leads to beta cell expansion. And this is something that we want in pregnancy. But a lot of inflammation, not a good thing, and leads to de-differentiation. So we know that the, the being obese or having type 2 diabetes leads to a systemic state of inflammation, where we have low-grade cytokines in the blood. And that might be contributing to beta cell failure. But we also have inflammation going on at the local level in the, in the islet. So what are the things that contribute to inflammation? Well, first of all, having high glucose levels. High glucose levels leads to, first of all, we, we said before, activating the mitochondria. But too much activation of the mitochondria leads to a lot of reactive oxygen species. Advanced glycation products do the same. Free fatty acids do the same. And LDL, modified LDL, does the same. Now the glucose and, the, and these uh, factors also activate something called the NLRP3 inflammasome. And what this does is it activates uh, for the secretion of interleukins and all sorts of cytokines into the milieu, calling, attracting all of those macrophages to come and, and live in the islet. Now what the problem is that these macrophages, they're angry, and they are secreting all sorts of nasty things that are making us de-differentiate our beta cells. What's interesting is if in, in rats, if you actually are able to deplete the macrophages, you see that the beta cells re-differentiate. So inflammation might be playing a role here as well. So in conclusion to this first part, we have glucotoxicity, we have lipotoxicity, and we have inflammation as possible causes of de-differentiation. And it's debated in the literature, is it this more than this, or what is the real culprit? But I think what's important is that we don't just have beta cell death. The fact that they just de-differentiate de de gives us a lot of hope because there's something we can do here. And how much is dead versus how much is de-differentiated depends on how long a person has been with hyperglycemia. So what can we do about this? How can we wake up these beta cells? Here Superman's being woken up and he becomes a super beta cell. So let's, let's look at some strategies for reawakening these. One of them is anti-inflammatory agents that since I just mentioned inflammation, uh, we would have thought that treating patients with anti-inflammatory agents, especially the interleukin 1b, which is the most prominent interleukin, would revert diabetes. But that actually turned out to be quite disappointing and did not pan out the way we expected it to. And many trials have been done, actually many more than you see on the slide, but none of them have really sh been as beneficial as we thought. And of course, we have side effects when you suppress the immune system that are not so desirable. Another strategy is treating the glucotoxicity with intensive insulin therapy. You know, the best tool to bring down sugar is just insulin. We know that for a fact. But uh, here's a study that was done on recently diagnosed type 2 diabetics. And they randomize them to two groups of people. Those that received intensive insulin therapy at the beginning using a pump, an insulin pump, and the others were just control. And they followed them for two years. And what they found, after the two to three weeks, they, the patients were followed with just diet. And what they found is that there was, at, at 24 months, 42% of patients 
were still diabetes free after just having received three weeks of intensive insulin therapy two years prior. So that's really interesting. And what they did is they looked back and saw who were those that actually responded. And it was those that had the lowest sugars during that time. So they divided it into tertiles. And here's a per proportion of patients on the y-axis and remission. And you can see that uh, the top line out of those three is the one that had the lowest mean blood glucose during those two to three weeks. So you have to get down to really, really good glucose in order to get an effect. But we know, and I learned from many of you guys here in the audience, that giving insulin to a patient with type 2 diabetes is not exactly logical. They pay, these patients have too much insulin to start off with. And we don't want to make the situation worse in other ways. Yes, we might clear the glucotoxicity, but insulin is not what we want to give. And also, these patients had hypoglycemia. So let's look at other strategies. Well, we know that bariatric surgery is the most clear case of beta cell recovery. These patients do really, really well. And after two years, 72% of them are diabetes free. And after 10 years, over a third of them are still without diabetes. Now, I think it's very interesting that when we look at this a little bit closer and we break it down by how long the duration of the diabetes was before the surgery, we can see that duration is critical. On the left, you see the, the light blue bars is those patients that were diabetes under one year. So if you had diabetes for under one year, you're going to be told, the chances of you being cured are very, very high. Even after 15 years, 50% 50 of these patients are doing great. But if you had diabetes for just four years, that's not a lot. And the, most of these patients have actually 15 years of, of diabetes before they go for surgery. Just four years decreases your chances of recovery. After two years, look, less than 50% recover. So... How long you've had diabetes, again, impacts how well we are able to revive those beta cells. Now, these beta cells, actually, if you are going to recover, they recover very fast. And most people think or th the, 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 there is an increase in incretin hormones, the GLP-1, for example, hormone that goes up immediately after the surgery. So they attribute it to the response to this hormone. But a, a professor by the name of Roy Taylor in England, in Newcastle, actually tested this, and it turns out to not be true. And he argues that it's actually the melting of the ectopic fat in the liver and in the pancreas that's more responsible for this. And I'll get into this in a second. But it is important to know that before we see a change on the scale, we see that the, the fat content in the liver goes down in, in, any, in any type of diet. And this decrease, you, you're not going to see. It's, micro, it's, it's grams. This, we're not going to see that on the scale. But the melting away of the fat at the liver level and at the pancreatic level seems to be uh, a very interesting thing. And so he argued, and the, and the timing of the melting away, that he noted by checking this with very sophisticated MRI techniques, said, wow, there's something to look into here. This looks very interesting. He said, well, if it's about the melting of the fat, then let's just not do the surgery and give these people a very, very low cal calorie diet and see if we get the same effect. So he said, let's check if weight loss through hypocaloric diet will reverse diabetes. And he did a study at first that was eight weeks long, and he looked at this in a great amount of detail by doing these MRIs on the patients. So he took diabetic patients and compared them to obese patients with the same weight but without diabetes. And what he noted was that the amount of liver fat, the hepatic triglycerides, went down. Let me see. I need a pointer. But you see the, the circle there on, on the left? That represents the people without diabetes. That's the, that's the control group. 
So the fat goes down, and as soon as it hits the fat level of the control group, which happens to be one week after the, the surgery or the, after the diet started, we see that the fasting insulin corrects. Because what's happening here is that the liver is suddenly freed up of this fat, and it's able to respond now to insulin. It is sensitive to insulin, and hence, it's able to stop cranking out the glucose, which is what a, a, a liver does when it's not insulin sensitive, right? When a liver has a lot of insulin resistance, it doesn't, it, it doesn't listen to the signal to stop cranking out sugar and just makes that fasting glucose really high. So in a winded way, what we're seeing is that we decrease the hepatic fat, we correct the fasting glucose. And the same thing happened here with the pancreas. He was able to, to, to do an MRI on these patients and follow them over time and see that as the, the fatty pancreas went away and reached the same level as fat as the control group, then the, phase, the first phase insulin response improved. What does that mean? It means that when, when we eat, we secrete insulin, and now, and when we have diabetes, that doesn't happen. And in this case, it it started to happen again. The insulin started to be released appropriately with meals. All right, so then he said, let's do a, ri a big trial and prove that this is really, this is true in a bigger, in a bigger longer term trial. And this trial really made headlines all around the world. Um, and what they did is they fed people 825 calorie, kilocalories a day for a year. Okay, well, it, they first gave them meal replacements, and then they slowly started to introduce food. But these patients had diabetes for only six years at a maximum. And everybody that responded lost a lot of weight. Everybody that was a participated lost a lot of weight. The average weight loss was 10 kilos after a year. But not everybody was able to reverse their diabetes, only 46%. So when he looked carefully through these sophisticated MRIs, he compared the liver fat and the pancreatic fat, and he saw that both of these groups, the responders and the non-responders, both lost the fat. So what was the problem? The problem was in the beta cell. The beta cells of the responders had been hyperglycemic for less time. They, apparently, their duration of diabetes was only 2.7 years versus the non-responders that were 3.8 years, years in duration. So again, in this case, we see that even though the fat corrected in the liver and the fat corrected in the pancreas, in both of, of in everybody, in everybody, in the responders and non-responders, only the responders had a shorter duration of diabetes. So moving on to my favorite strategy, which is a very low carb diet. Because yes, we can decrease the ectopic fat with a very low carb diet, and it's much more fun to do. We get to eat steak, and we get to eat strawberries and cream, and it is much easier and, um, real, and, and, and it's just feasible and fun. And the thing is that there's so much more benefit to the beta cells when we eat this way. Because not only are we getting rid of the ectopic fat, but also we treat the glucotoxicity and the lipotoxicity, we decrease the modified LDL, and it elevates ketones, which are anti-inflammatory. So let's talk about this for just a second. What I wanted to say before, by the way, about the, other, about the low calorie trial, is that it was 825 kilocalories but that ended up being 120 grams of fat a day, which was very surprising because you would expect it such few calories, it would be less carbs, but it was actually what we would consider a little bit of carby. So the reason why we, de by even, we eat 20 grams of carbs in this diet, for example, between 20 and 50, so this really decreases the glucotoxicity because we're stopping from bringing in all of the sugar into the blood all the time. So this relaxes the inflammation, the reactive oxygen species. We have less advanced glycation products, less uh, complications that happen from the glucose 
binding to proteins in the blood. We have less free fatty acids because we are decreasing the triglycerides significantly. And the LDL improves in quality. So all of this decreases the inflammation. And besides that, ketones are not just fuel sources. They're actually also signaling metabolites. They do other things, which I think is really fascinating. And they, they are actually decreasing the mitochondrial reactive oxygen species. And they're acting on this NLRP3 inflammasome directly. They directly inhibit this so there is less inflammation. So for many reasons, it's very interesting. Now we know that in this trial, the Virta Health trial, took patients with diabetes, fed them a very low, well-formulated ketogenic diet, and after a year, 60% of the patients achieved an A1C of less than 6.5, uh, either with no meds at all or with metformin. And here, let's, con let's compare the continuous care intervention on the left to the usual care on the right. And what you see is that I, I changed the units to A1C percent because it's easier for me from the new way of the new units that we're less familiar with. We see that the, the higher the A1C, of course, you're going to have a greater response. Usually in diabetes, no, if you're starting from very high A1C, the chances of, of seeing improvements are very high. But the closer we get to a lower A1C, the harder it is to see improvement. But in the continuous care intervention that received the low-carb diet, you will see that there was improvement at, no matter how, what your A1C was. Contrast that to the usual care. And in the usual care, the, the, high, the group that started out with very high glucoses improved a little bit. But we see worsening of diabetes in the lower A1C groups. And this is what we see in practice. Diabetes gets worse. This is why the slides at the beginning of, the sh of every presentation. We treat diabetes and yet it usually gets worse with the usual care. Also, this very low carb diet leads to an, energy expend an increase in energy expenditure in contrast to a very low calorie diet. And I think this is beneficial because it allows us to maintain this diet. We're not freezing and starving. We actually are able to en enjoy the in increased energy expenditure. So this is another reason why I prefer this strategy. So in our clinic, uh, we are, um, myself and uh, two dietitians, Adina is here joining me from Israel. We have a nurse. We have a psychotherapist, and uh, we, we've been treating this way for, we opened about four years ago, and it's been like a three and a half years since I really dove in with the patient care. Um, and here's one of our, our patients. His name is Nicolas. And Nicolas came to me with an A1C of 10.8. And he was just recently diagnosed. And he was, uh, you know, feeling terrible and thought he was about to die, and this is what he, t he was told. And um, I told him, listen, it's going to be okay. You're going to eat a lot of fat, and you're going to cut out all this stuff, and it's all going to be good. And this is four months later. And his A1C was 4.8 four months later. It was really unbelievable. And this is, he's one of many, many, many patients. But he actually started writing a blog, so it was, it's, uh, it was easy to get his pictures, because they were online. <laughs> um, and he continues to be at an A1C of 4.8 after three and a half years. Um, he is without medications. So this is what happens when we treat diabetes right away, okay? So his father, Hector, who's also my patient, he has had diabetes for 30 years. And he, you know, I, I was his doctor before I went through the low carb conversion. So I had him on insulin and Actos, SGLT2, Victoza. I had him all the, and all these medications and he was fairly well treated. He had an A1C of seven and he was what we would consider controlled. He was controlled. And when I told him that I went through this conversion and that I, I, I was going to, he almost died. He was like, you've, got, you've lost your marbles. You've really gone crazy telling me now to eat fat. 
But I, that's what I did. And he lost all the insulin. He doesn't take any more insulin. He doesn't take any, any of most of the medications. I took off the Actos. I took off the SGLT2. But still, I can't get him off the GLP-1 and the metformin, even though his A1C is 5.7. And the reason is because he's had diabetes for 30 years. And too bad that we didn't start this 30 years ago. But he's, he's doing great. Uh, but he's just, it's just an example, a living example of the, the father and child the, of, of how important it is to reverse the diabetes right away. So in conclusion, beta cells are not all dead. Most are actually de-differentiated, and there's a lot we can do. Correcting the hyperglycemia, the free fatty acids, and the inflammation improve beta cell function. If we decrease the ectopic fat in the liver and the pancreas, this can correct the diabetes if your beta cells are still around. Diabetes is reversible, but again, the severity and the duration are extremely important in determining how reversible. And timing is of the essence, which is why primary care doctors need to be involved in this so that we can do this ASAP and not wait till we get to specialists. So thank you very, very much.